a few vocalists there for a moment. <laughs> Jamie's got a haircut this morning. <laughs> okay. Uh, is everybody doing okay today? I'm glad you are here. This is a special day. 52 times a year we gather to celebrate the resurrection. And this is the Sunday right before Thanksgiving. Abraham Lincoln, right in the middle of the Civil War in 1863, he declared that the Thursday, this Thursday, is Thanksgiving. And let's remember <clears throat> why we have Thanksgiving. And I pray that God's Word this morning will help us to, to see the importance of remembering Him and giving thanks to Him for who He is and what He's doing. Dennis Kenlaw, in his devotional, This Day with the Master, Dennis Kenlaw was past president of Asbury College, and he was on staff at the seminary part of the time I was there. Um, he writes this, I was sitting on an airplane next to a man who claimed to be an atheist and who told me a story that I've never forgotten. It was the story of why he believed in prayer. He said, I used to have vicious migraine headaches, and I thought they were going to drive me crazy, and medicine could do nothing for me. One day I thought, religious people pray. I didn't know anything about religion, didn't even believe in God, but I thought it surely couldn't hurt to try, so I prayed. I said, Lord, I don't know if you are, and if you are, I don't know whether you can help me or not, and if you are, and you can, I don't know whether you would or not, but if you are, and if you could, and if you would take away these headaches, I would be very grateful. Do you know what? The headaches went away. I thought to myself that it was a very happy coincidence. And then I had a second thought. That's a cheap way out. What if God is? And what if he did? If I attribute my healing to chance, it would be extremely ungracious. So I prayed again, Lord, I don't know whether you are or not, and I don't know whether you did or not, but if you are, and if you did, I want you to know I'm grateful. Then I had another thought, he, he told Dennis Kenlaw. There have been many good things that have happened in my life that I assumed were accidents. I wonder if these are blessings from God also. And if they are, I have never even told him thanks. So he said, I prayed again. I don't know whether you exist or not. I don't know whether you're responsible for the good things in my life. But if you had anything to do with them, I want you to know my gratitude. And then Dennis Kinlaw writes, are you as grateful to God as that atheist was? Are we going to be thankful and grateful this morning, this Thanksgiving season, for who God is? Because we know that he is. And we know that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Let's pray together before we read out of 1 Chronicles 16. Lord, anoint your word this morning. May our hearts be leaning to you. And may you help us have the right attitude. An attitude of thanks and an attitude of what now, Lord? What do you want me to do? Permit me to preach, Lord. Let your word go forth like a sharp two-edged sword. Lord, like a hammer, you just pound into our lives the truth so that we will forever be changed and will forever be grateful. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. First Chronicles chapter 16, I'm going to read the first 11 verses. We could read this entire chapter because it is a song of thanksgiving. The first few verses kind of help us to understand what they're thankful for, and then there's a long song of thanksgiving. We're going to talk about some of that, but let's read the first 11 verses right now. They brought the ark of God and set it inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And they presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before God. And after David had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. And then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each Israelite man and woman. He appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord to extol, to thank, and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. Asaph was the chief, and next to him in rank was Zechariah, then Jaziel, Shemiramoth, Jehiel, 
Mathithia, Eliab, Benaiah, Obed-Edom, and Jael. They were to play the lyres and the harps. Asap was to sound the cymbals. And Benaiah and Jehaziel, the priests, were to blow the trumpets regularly before the ark of the covenant of God. To make a long story short, the Israelites had recaptured the Ark of the Covenant at this point. The Ark of the Covenant was where God's glory resided. And the Philistines had defeated the Israelites and they had taken the Ark of the Covenant away. Now King David has gotten the Ark of the Covenant back. He's got a special tent prepared for it. And the Ark of the Covenant is now back with the Israelites. God's blessing, God speaks to His people. They've got the Ark of the Covenant back. And they're excited. And this is the psalm of thanksgiving, that they are to remain thankful and grateful to God because His presence is back with them. His presence means power. It means victory. His presence means that they'll have every need that they have taken care of. So verse 7, that day David first appointed Asap and his associates to give praise to the Lord in this manner. Give praise or thanks, some translations say here. Give thanks to the Lord. Proclaim His name. Make known among the nations what He has done. Sing to Him. Sing praise to Him. Tell of all of His wonderful acts. Glory in His holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord, verse 11 says, and his strength. Seek His face always. This morning as we, as we study this passage of Scripture, I want to mention four key thoughts that will help us to, to have a song of thanksgiving in our hearts. I want to, I want to encourage you. I want, to, I want you to lean on the Lord this morning and, and say, Lord, I, if, if I have been ungrateful, Lord, I apologize. I repent. I want to live a life of thanksgiving to you for who you are. Yes, Lord, I'm, I'm thankful for everything around me. But Lord, I'm most grateful and thankful for you because you are my God, you are my Redeemer, and you supply all of my needs. The first thing I want us to look at here in this section of, uh, that we read is found in verse 11, what we should be seeking. Here, I want to suggest from God's Word this morning what you and I should be seeking what we should be looking for in life, what, what we should be hungry for. What, what are you seeking in life? Verse 11 sums it up very well. Let me reread verse 11. Look to the Lord and His strength. Seek His face always. That's what we ought to be seeking. Look to the Lord. Seek His face, His strength. I like the way Isaiah 45 verse 22 says, Turn to me and be saved. The King James says, verse 22 of Isaiah 45, Look to me, all the ends of the earth, and be saved. So God is saying, hey, I'm at the center. I'm at the center of everything. And no matter where you are in this world, if you will turn and look to me, you can be saved. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, uh, he preached to four and 5,000 people in London morning and Sunday night before there were mega churches. Charles Spurgeon, one Sunday right before Christmas, it was snowing. Uh, he grew up in London, and the preacher couldn't even get to the church that morning. He found his way to a little Methodist chapel. There was a layperson who was, who was filling in because the preacher couldn't be there because of the weather. There were about 10 or 12 people. Charles Spurgeon, a 16-year-old, walks into the back of the church and sits in the very back. And the layperson takes about five minutes, and he exhausts everything he could say. But this is the verse he read from. He said, look to me, God says, all the ends of the earth and be saved. And he pointed to that young 60-year-old and said, young man, you, need, you look like you need to look to God. And Charles Spurgeon looked to the Lord that morning, and he was saved. That's where our thanksgiving begins, isn't it? When we look to God, and we know that he has redeemed our life. John 3.16, we all know that verse of Scripture. But right before that, Jesus is explaining to Nicodemus, Nicodemus the Pharisee, the teacher, he doesn't understand about new birth. He didn't understand about being born again. And Jesus said in verse 14 of John 3, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever looks to him 
for whoever believes in him will be saved. That's part of our purpose this morning, isn't it? We can't really be thankful like God wants us to be until we look to him. Romans 10, 13. And if you're lost this morning and undone and in in need of a Savior, or if if you're just not sure, you, you may have been in church all your life, but Christ has never been born into you. I want to encourage you this morning, just just remember Romans 10, 13. Everyone or whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Look to God for salvation. Look to God for strength. That's what verse 11 says. Look to the Lord and his strength. Because when we look to the Lord, we find his help. We find his strength in, in our time of need. Uh, you, you've all heard of Henry Ford. Henry Ford was multimillionaire, and uh, when he when he died shortly after his death, uh, they found a little shoebox underneath his workbench, and they looked in that box, and there was a tiny test tube, and and on that test tube, it said in, on a piece of tape, Thomas Edison's last breath. A little tiny test tube said Thomas Edison's last breath. And the folks who knew him knew what that meant. Because earlier, when folks were telling him it's impossible, you're not going to ever invent an automobile that's going to run on gasoline. It just won't ever work. You can't do it. He saw Thomas Edison at a banquet. Thomas Edison was already a renowned inventor. And that night, he had an opportunity to speak with Thomas Edison. And Thomas and Edison, after hearing Henry Ford's plans to build an automobile, Thomas Edison, the famous inventor, said, do it. You can do it. Go build it. And he did. And he kept that little test tube as a reminder. That was the last thing Thomas Edison ever said to him. You can do it. And brothers and sisters, I want you to hear God speaking to you this morning. You can do it. You can be saved. You can be redeemed. You can be changed. You can be transformed. Your life can be renewed. You can live the kind of life that God has planned for you, not the life that Satan wants to keep you pulled down and dragged down. Jesus looks at us with double vision. He looked at Levi and said, you're Matthew. He looked at Simon and he said, you're Peter, you're you're the rock. He was walking down the street one day and he looked up and saw Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was the tax collector that everybody shunned. But Jesus said, Zacchaeus, I'm going to go to your house that day. Jesus loved Zacchaeus, but Jesus had to speak into his life so he could be transformed. And that's what our culture needs to hear today. God loves every one of us, but he needs to speak into our lives individually so that we can be transformed, so we can be changed. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Seek the Lord's face. Have you ever been misunderstood maybe with a text message or an email message? It's happened. It has, you, you try to be funny, and it's just, it doesn't come across that way. You find out somebody just didn't, they totally misunderstood your text or your email. You know what changes all that? What fixes all that? If you can be face to face. And that's what God wants for you and me. If we're not seeking his face, we're going to be confused. But, but if, we, if we seek his face, if, if we're not seeking his hands, If we're not saying, Lord, what are you going to do for me? But we're seeking his face. We want to have a relationship with him. Because God says in in the book of James, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. We can see, we can be in his presence. We can enjoy his fellowship when we look to God for salvation and for his strength. And we seek his face always. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, we all with unveiled faces are being changed, being transformed because of his glory that's being shed abroad upon our hearts. So we seek him. This Thanksgiving season, let's make sure that we're seeking the Lord and his strength. And hear what he's saying to you. There's an old proverb that inside every one of us there's a king or a queen. And when we speak to that king or that queen, come out, it happened. May you hear the Lord of Lords speak to your heart this morning. That there's, there's a king, there's a queen inside you. Uh, God's strength is made available. 
Let him change us. Let him help us to be truly grateful and thankful because of our relationship with him. We, we seek him. Second thing, let's look back in 1 Chronicles 16. The first half of verse 9. Here's what we should be singing. Here's what we should sing. Sing to him, verse 9 says, sing praise to him. Right now, I wish I could snap my fingers and our band would be up and we'd be ready to sing a praise song. Would you, would you praise him a little bit better right now after hearing God's word? Sing praise to him. We can't be silent if our God is redeeming us, if he's saving us, if he's lifting us up. Look at verse 23 if you've got that chapter still open. This is the, the song of thanksgiving. Verse 23 says, sing to the Lord all the earth, all the earth. That certainly includes you and me, doesn't it? You say, I can't sing. Yeah, you can try. I, can't, I can make a noise. We can all, if, 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 if the love of God is transforming our lives, we, we just can't, can't keep it quiet. We can't be quiet. I want to read a couple of verses from Psalm 40. The psalmist says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. That's where it all began. We wait, we wait upon the Lord. We wait patiently upon the Lord. And the psalmist says, he turned to me. He heard my cry. Isn't that good news? When we call upon the Lord, He is there. He will listen. He will turn to us. But the first church I had the privilege of pastoring after seminary, we were there four years, and after we, after we moved, Susan went back to Roanoke to get her hair cut for about three or four or five years. I don't know why she couldn't find somebody to cut her hair in Birmingham, but she drove an hour and a half to get her hair cut for several years. One of the times she was getting her hair cut, she went to visit Wilson and Doris. Wilson Doris were our next door neighbors. They were actually across the cow field from us, but they were our closest neighbors. Doris was the treasurer of the church, and Wilson appeared to be a gruff individual, talked real, real gruff, but, but he had the heart of a child. And Susan went back to see Doris and Wilson one of the times she got her hair cut. And, and Wilson, she had heard Wilson was very sick with cancer, and he was in the bed. And she talked to Doris to see Wilson, and, and he said, Susan, come in, come in, shut the door. He said, shut the door. He said, I don't want everybody to hear this. Some people think I'm crazy. He said, but Susan, I saw God. And Susan said, you saw God? He said, yes, and, and tears welled up. And he said, and God, he came to me and he said, I love you. God came to me and said, I love you. This verse says, if we wait patiently upon the Lord, he will Turn to us. He'll turn to me and you. He loves us. Verse 2 says, He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the miry clay, and He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. Verse 3, He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Don't forget that. Don't miss that. God will turn to us. He will lift us up out of the pit that we can't get out of. He will redeem our lives. He will... Give us a firm place to stand, and he'll give you a new song to sing. Are you singing your new song? Oh, we know the old song, don't we? Oh, the old song is all around us. Moral, relativism, cultural depravity, spiritual apathy, churches that are lukewarm. That's the old song. But we gather this morning, don't we, followers of Jesus Christ, to sing a new song. He's our Redeemer. He's the one who saved us. He's the one who's with us. He's the one who's going to go with us to help us to be everything He wants us to be. So we, we seek Him, and then we sing a new song. We sing a new song. Silence is, is, is not an option. One of my favorite little choruses, this is, Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so full and free. Thank you, Lord. Would you, would you say that at least in your heart right now? Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so full and free. And toward the end of the book in Revelation, John has a vision of heaven. And in chapter 5, the one sitting on the throne, the Father, is holding a scroll. 
it is sealed with seven seals. And one of the angels declares that there's, there's no one that can open the seals, break the seals and open the scroll. Not in heaven or on earth or under the earth. And John begins to weep. It says he, weep, he wept bitterly. And then, and then one said, don't, don't cry any longer because there is someone. There's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's coming. And when John looked, he saw him. He looked like a lamb who had been slain. And immediately the, the, the lamb was standing in the center and the, the 24 elders and the, and the four creatures were around them. And as the lamb took the scroll and began to open it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders all fell on their faces before the lamb and before the throne. And they began to sing a new song. Worthy. Worthy is the one who was slain, who has redeemed us with his blood and has made us a kingdom of priests to live and to serve in his kingdom. Worthy is the lamb this morning. So we, 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 we want to look to him, we want to seek him, and we want to sing the new song. If, if you don't have a new song to sing, I recommend this morning that you, that you fall on your face before God and say, God, I, I need you. I, I want your salvation. I want your grace. The, the third thing we see here is what we should surrender. Look in verse 8. Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Give thanks to God and proclaim his name. This is what we should surrender. We should be in the habit of proclaiming his name. Roland Allen, the great missionary, told the story that there was a medical missionary who came to him after one of his sermons who had served for many years in India. And in the, in the, the region of India where this medical missionary had, had ministered for many years, he said there was a progressive problem with people's eyesights and they were losing their eyesight. But he, he came up with a, with a method, a, a type of surgery where he could operate on their eyes and they would not lose their eyesight. And he said, the medical missionary said to Roland Allen, after I performed the surgery on them and they knew that they were going to be able to continue to see, he said there was not a word for thank you in their dialect. But they said this, I will tell your name. They had a word that meant I will tell your name. And wherever they went, they would tell the name of the surgeon who had healed them. I will tell your name. Has God healed you? Has God redeemed your life? Then praise the God and tell Tell his name wherever you go, whatever you do. Don't be ashamed that God's grace is sufficient and he's growing his kingdom, he's growing his church, and as we tell his name, others will become more and more interested in the grace that will transform and lift them out of the pit and give them a new song to sing. Uh, the ten lepers in Luke chapter 17, you remember the story. Jesus said, well, where are the other nine? Only one came back. But it tells us in verse 9 of that chapter, when he saw that he had been healed. Thanksgiving begins with, with that realization that God has changed my life, that God is with me. He is my help. Then he came back and he, he proclaimed in a loud voice, thanks to Jesus. And then he fell on his knees before Jesus. He was prostrate before Jesus, worshiping him. That's the true spirit of thanksgiving. What what we seek, what we sing, what we surrender. And the last thing, what, what are we to say? Look at the last half of verse 9. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Child of God, tell of all of his wonderful acts. Verse 24 complements this verse. It says, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all the peoples. We can't keep silent. If you've got a new song, you're going to sing it. A professor at Asbury named Robert Coleman, he was in charge of evangelism. He was <clears throat> during World War II in an ROTC, ROTC camp in Mineral Springs, Texas. And as World War II ended, the paper boy came to the camp and started declaring, good news, good news, read all about it. You, you remember when paper boys would good news, good, read all about it, good news. World War II had ended, and Robert Coleman made this statement, good news cannot be self-contained. And the message 
will not be concealed. Good news. Do you have good news? Good news. If it's a child being born, a grandchild, if it's your favorite team has won, good news. We will not keep it secret, will we? How much more so the fantastic good news that our God has come to this planet in the form of, of His only Son, Jesus Christ, and has in potential redeemed every life. If we will look to the cross, if we will call on the name of the Lord, we will be saved. I want to read the last two verses in this song, verse 34, 35. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Cry out, save us, God our Savior. Gather us, deliver us from the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name, that we may give thanks to your holy name. I want to close the sermon this morning. I found this blog by a man named David McLemore. His blog is entitled Things of This Sort. He said, years ago I was serving with my church at, at the Nashville Rescue Mission. It was a cold Friday, cold Friday night. I had finished serving food and sat down by one man. By God's providence, he wanted to talk about the Lord. This is great, I thought. No need to find a way to bring God into the conversation because he's just jumped right in. How do you enter the gates of God, he asked me. I searched my mind and I found that I, what I thought was the reasonable answer. With joy, I said, nope, he responded. With praise, I shot back. Wrong, he replied. He went, we went back and forth like this for felt like forever. Finally, he said, aha, I've caught you not reading your Bible. How do you enter the gates of God? And then he answered his question, Psalm 100, verse 4, enter his gates with thanksgiving. He was waiting for the word thanksgiving. Here was a homeless man receiving food he didn't buy from a man he didn't know in a room full of other homeless men escaping the winter heat, and he had a treasure that I didn't know about. Of all the things he could have brought up, he wanted to talk about thankfulness to God. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. A few years ago when we were sending astronauts to the moon, I read an interview with one of the astronauts' wife after everything was over and the the reporter said, what was the most exciting part of all that for you? And then he said, what, was it when your husband went into orbit? She said, no. Was it when he took a step on the moon? And she said, no. Was it when they redocked and headed back to Earth? She said, no. And then he was perplexed. He said, well, what was the most exciting part of that for you? She said, when my husband stepped foot on the boat. In other words, when he got back to this planet, when he was safe, that was what was most exciting to her. This morning, there are a lot of people who are, who are running all over creation. God is waiting. And the most exciting moment to him about our lives is when we come home. Would you come home this morning? Would you give him first place in your life and heart? Would you become a person who worships him and gives him thanks and praises his holy name and let his name be known among the heathen? Let's stand for a word of prayer. I want to ask the praise team to come up. As we enter into this time of commitment, if there's someone here this morning who needs Jesus, you may be, the Holy Spirit may be speaking, you've not been very grateful, you've not been very thankful. You've been more frustrated than grateful and thankful. You've been more stressed than blessed. You've not experienced the peace of the Lord, but you've experienced all the uncertainties of this world. Today could be a big step in the right direction. Our altars are going to be open as the music begins. You come and just let the Lord Jesus reign over you. Let, just seek his face this morning. Seek his presence in your life. Just say, Lord, I, 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 I'm, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Come into my life. Lord, I hear you knocking. Lord, I want you 
I want to truly be a grateful, thankful person from this day forward and forevermore. Lord, we thank you for so great salvation and how you're able to lift us up out of that pit that we can't get out of. Lord, give us all a solid place to stand and a new song to sing as we go forward. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You come as the Lord leads you.